right. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Zach Jackson, and I am a principal engineer over at Lululemon. Um, also work with the Webpack core team. And uh, today I'll be talking about a new feature called module federation. Um, and we'll take it away. So uh, module federation aims to solve some challenges that we have in the JavaScript industry at large. And one of them is sharing code is hard and it gets much harder at scale. So if we've ever had to deal with two apps that run separately, but they need to share something, uh, we'll have probably encountered inconvenience, NPM being slow, uh, the complexity will balloon as you need to share more and more. And any sharing that you actually do is usually primitive. So if we look at something like, let's say externals, that's usually the most common way to like share something. Um, externals is very, primitive in, in, in the way that it does it because you're very much locked into like that top level request or, um, or you just have to do it all by hand. And uh, it's in, at the end of the day, not scalable. The motivation behind module federation was really for mid to large scale platforms or businesses. Some, a company that really can't operate as a monolith and just has tons of independent applications or the need for applications to run standalone, but also run together as if they were in a monolithic compiled system. Uh, obviously multiple teams looking for autonomous workflows and a big goal behind module federation was to try and avoid learning curves. I don't really want you to change your development patterns when you are using a federated application or when you're creating one, sharing resources. And some of the other things we want to do really focus on here is avoiding multiple copies of the same library. We want to share our vendor code, but still stay flexible. We don't want to have UX drawbacks like a full page refresh or, you know, really large uh, library downloads because it's downloading a whole nother bundle. And I really don't want to have to depend on CI to pull together my system. So let's set a little bit of context here. Um, we have, let's say we have some kind of an app that looks something like this. And I want to say, let's say each part of these squares is a separate federated app, or even just the colors are separately federated. You'd have an app, might have a header, dashboard profile, some pages, a sidebar, style guide components, which is maybe in another repo deployed on its own, and data fetching logic, which also might be in another repo or deployed somewhere else. And the idea is we want to be able to split this application in various different ways. And some of the ways that we've outlined here is you've got your UI, you've got styling, or you've got, you know, logic. And each part should ideally, in this case, be developed by a separate team and deployed independently. So if we look at an app like this, and I want to deploy any of these squares independently, that starts to get a little bit tricky to do. Um, and that's really what Module Federation is coming around here to try and help us with is any of these cubes can be deployed independently by another team, and they can be consumed in real time at runtime by any consuming application that needs it. So the problem at a high level is nothing really feels smooth. Like we've got something like, let's say we can create a library and the library gets split out and installed or loaded in. You could use ESI or you could use a micro front end and route them back into each independent app. But the problem with all of these is they really require a manual step of breaking your app apart. What we're trying to do with, say, module federation here is instead of removing pieces of an application, we actually just allow you to import modules from a separately compiled app. And that's really the smoothness that we're trying to give. And you can kind of do this with script loaders or other things today, um, but you lose out on the smoothness aspect. Uh, you have to learn something new. It has to be done in a specific way. And also when the script's loaded, doesn't necessarily mean that the Webpack is actually done running and making those modules available. So it does get a little tricky if you're trying to do sophisticated code sharing like systems. They're also usually quite brittle. Um, they're hard to roll out. And especially when it comes to shared dependency updates, if you say uh, used a one of these solutions for say your micro front ends and you don't want to share react among them all 
you could make React a global or an external. But as soon as you do that, how do you upgrade React? What happens if the rest of the company isn't ready to upgrade React? It's very tedious. Everyone has to be ready for the update to flip at exactly the same time. So it's still not giving us that flexibility that, that we're quite after. Um, and of course, you know, UX is also often impacted just because you're forcing the guests to download more data, more JavaScript, or um, in general, how it usually looks is, you know, there's a page refresh in between, or you're downloading an entirely separate single page app and just booting it in div on a current page, which all leads to a slower delay to the guest. We also usually see a lot of code duplication, and that's mostly because um, any of the things that we do we typically revolve around some form of um, manual process like externals. So trying to remove that duplication, the algorithm only does such a good job internally, and it's also very uh, manually managed. So there's always code duplication that we'll usually see sneak into these things. If you built out an in-house solution to kind of loading these scripts or giving you this kind of micro front end feel, it's most usually quite complex um, and also it requires this continued maintenance. And when we get to SSR, it's usually an even bigger nightmare to deal with when we're talking about things at runtime. So if we're gonna take a quick look at our existing options here. We've got native ESM. Some of the bonuses are just the facts of it is there's no build to link parts, foreign code is natively consumable, but on the flip side, there's no tree shaking. It only works with the ESM. So we can't get anything like side effects, styles, or assets to be optimized and, and rooted through, um, through ESM. Uh, and the, uh, there's some performance issues with it. Preloading has to be required. There's a high RTT and you make a lot of requests. If we look at the single build, which is just a normal monolith, everything's built together, which is great. Foreign modules are accessible during the build. So while I'm compiling it, I could reach out and grab foreign modules, but that doesn't help me at runtime and would still require a full rebuild to get any module that you want into the system. Um, the big down draws of our usual single monolithic builds is any change would require a full, full deploy. The builds get slower and they get bottlenecked by teams and build pipelines and you know deployment priorities. We have uh, multiple apps, which they can't really be separate. So you kind of sacrifice this shared system at runtime. It's essentially turn you know, your normal monolith. If we look at externals, parts, and when I say parts here, I really mean like pieces of a application. Um, a header could be a part, um, you know, something like that. It's kind of what we consider a part or separately coded by another team. Um, parts are, you know, built separately and exposed globally, which is kind of what we've been using for several years with Webpack 4 to do something like this. Uh, our apps can pretty much be, are, are built to depend on externals. Um, the one issue you have with that is it's not really a, a self-running app. As soon as you introduce externals, you introduce another file that has to be there that if it's not there, your app will not run. And it also introduces a central point of failure. Uh, some of the down draws of externals is there's no on-demand loading capabilities. Uh, additional libraries have to be created. It's not very flexible and it's very dependent on external code, no fail safes. We take a look at DLL plugin. This was a kind of a step in the right direction, but still not quite there. Parts of the parts are built out as DLLs um, and the app is built to depend on these DLLs. Um, you need a rebuild when parts change, which can introduce deploy delays. You need additional DLLs to be created the whole time. And you also need extra infrastructure for the compile time dependencies. And yeah, again, highly dependent on external code. So what we kind of rule out here is native ESM isn't great for web performance. A single build is really not great for build performance. And DLL or externals is too much manual work to actually be a real solution. So what we were looking for is something with good well build performance, good web performance, and a solution to sharing our dependencies. 
Introducing Module Federation. And I would say Module Federation is an inevitability. It is where we are going, um, whether we like it or not. The, this kind of model is just something that I believe is really the next step in JavaScript architecture. So let's get down some of the terminology. Module Federation, it's essentially uh, got, it got its name from Apollo's GraphQL Federation, mostly because everybody would kind of understand what that meant. Um, it's, it's like uh, Apollo's Graph Federation, but it's applied to your JavaScript modules and it will work in the browser or in Node.js, which means that this is a universal system. Uh, it's not about uh, running browser specific or server specific. Anything that runs the JavaScript runtime environment can essentially use Federation. So we have a couple other things that we refer to in a federated app. Um, these are kind of standard terminologies we use at Webpack and I use in everything that I do. Um, we have something called a host. So a host is essentially the first Webpack runtime that gets initialized on the page. So if you had a micro front end stack and you had a home page and about page, something else, and all those pages really were on separate uh, node services or, or uh, separately built apps like micro front ends, then the host would be whatever page you land on. Um, so if I landed on the home micro front end, then the first, you know, Webpack app that is going to be there is obviously the home app. So we call that the host. Um, if I flip to another page and do a page reload and that other page is a separate build, then that page would become the host. So the host is really not dependent on any build. It's dependent on which, which app are you in, which one runs first. Um, so yeah. So that's pretty much what we would call a host. Then we have something called a remote. And the remote is essentially these other color components in here, which are being pulled in from a remote location. Um, we have what we kind of call a remote container or under the hood in Webpack, it's called a container. Um, and what a host is doing is essentially attaching itself to these remote modules and then pulling them in. So the remote is essentially not this thing. It's the stuff that you're going to get from another team's build. That's what we refer to it as. Then we have something called bidirectional host. So what this pretty much means is that a, it can be both a host or a remote, or it can operate in either mode. Um, if you think, uh, if we compare this to like some older tactics in Webpack, let's say uh, you create a library. Uh, if you create a library, then your build is a library. And if you wanted to create another build um, to make it like a single page app or something that starts itself, you would have to create another Webpack target and build that. So in this scenario, module federation, you don't change anything about your build other than using the plugin, but it can operate in both host or remote mode, which means that it can run standalone. And as you can see here, I would have two separate host apps. And as you can see from the interchange of the arrows, we're essentially pulling in different components from two different live hosts and consuming them in different ways on each of the hosts. So then we get into what was kind of like the biggest step forward in module federation. And this came out around beta 17. Um, and this is the concept of an omnidirectional host. So what this ends up becoming is essentially we've got you know three hosts or whatever here. But then all of the dependencies are essentially in this little grouping here. And what it makes everything or what it makes everything do is they all essentially will act as both a remote and a host at once. So when the host starts itself, it's only partially aware that it's the host application, but it only after the Webpack runtime boots and runs does it actually figure out what it is. So it's operating in this omnidirectional mode. What ability this gives us is that um, I can use semantic versioning here, which we have built into module federation and it reads it off the installed module in your node modules directory. And uh, I could have, you know, let's say I've got a, a patch version of React, a newer patch version of React, and, you know, um, a really old copy of React, like React 15. What would happen is, what the runtimes would essentially negotiate between each other before actually kickstarting the app and figure out who has the best copy of React to run. So if this one's a patch version off from that one, 
semantic versioning rules would dictate Webpack will consume this one's version of React, even if this one is the host that I'm visiting. So it won't just get this module, but they'll all communicate, all these remote pieces will communicate in here, understand who has the best version of React for our semantic versioning, and then they will depend on that copy. And if something were to go wrong in that, this mechanism also offers us the ability to fall back. So if we have a missing dependency or for whatever reason we can't get it, um, we can query anybody else connected to our network and ask them to please vend this missing file module or dependency that another application needs. Um, in the case here, let's say this is React 15 and we have two different React 16s that are you know, gonna be using the latest patch version. What happens to React 15 over here? Well, we can create separate share scopes within here and we could have a React 15 host with a React 16 remote component with say hooks in it and it would work in this setup um, through a couple things that we've kind of developed. One of them is an adapter pattern that we manually implement, but the mechanisms are there to allow us to create systems like this. So what is module federation exactly? It allows us to import code from other builds at runtime. We can share our vendor code dynamically at runtime. We can deploy independent single page apps without needing to redeploy their consumers. We have redundancy and self-healing capabilities built into the architecture. That's essentially the sum up of it. Micro front ends will work like a monolith, which is really, really awesome. And also this solves a lot of issues with server side rendering. The developer experience is improved without compromising our user's experience. We also can get evergreen code directly from each separate build. And of course, this will work in any JavaScript environment, which makes it very flexible and very easy to handle universal applications. One big thing to call out though, module federation is not a framework. This is a, this is a piece of Webpack that we re-architected and, and redesigned. And as such, it does not do any implementation details handling for you. You need to handle whatever you want it to do. It gives you the ability to require code from over the wire locations or other builds. Uh, but if you want a framework around it, you could use something like single SPA or next JS, which is busy moving to module federation or next JS, which with next 10 will be supporting and leveraging model federation. Um, we will see this coming to Angular CLI pretty soon. And I know um, Jupyter Lab already is using this as well as Storybook is starting to experiment with it. But, you know, essentially the open source projects will fill in the framework misses that the new capability has. So looking a little deeper into module federation here, as you can see, I touched on it briefly before with our host remote setup, but each app is essentially a separate application. We have the actual host app, which is the one that's going to be initialized and running. It depends on a remote container, which could also be a host. And this container is depending on a nested remote. So by using this, I need to also get this. One of the nice things is Webpack, the way we've designed this runtime is well, you don't pay for the RTT. So when host app one runs and we need chunks from here or chunks from here, those are all done in parallel up front. So as soon as the app boots, it knows what it needs and it goes and fetches it. It's not uh, discovering them as you go through the application. So our RTT is really just one and everything's delivered in a single round trip. Um, so going into a bit more of an example here, uh, let's say we've got team A, B, and some dependencies. So team A is our application, and we're looking at this from like a single build view. And what we're essentially doing is we're going to load, load code across teams A and B. So team A has an app, they have a home page. That home page uses team B's dropdown, and team B's dropdown has a natural dependence on the arrow icon because it's part of the component. And the dropdown itself depends on React. The homepage depends on React. This login modal, which is you know dynamically imported, it depends on you know the component. And this component actually depends on a button from Team B, which all of them depend on React. 
So that's kind of what a graph would look like from team A's perspective. They're consuming pieces from team B. Now, if we look at team B's perspective on this, they're going to expose button and drop down. They don't need to expose arrow icon because this module already requires it. And we can look up what other dependence it has inside of Webpack and Webpack will resolve it correctly and get the modules that are required for it. Uh, and then of course we would mark React as shared. In other words, we intend to use the same version or share the same or share our React version with other applications. And this is how we prevent uh, multiple versions of React errors from popping up. And it's also how we reduce the download effort or the, the payload that you need to download for the user. So if we start to dig a little deeper into the Webpack architecture, what we've got is container reference. And so container reference is really what a host app uses. Um, when you import some code from us, our syntax is literally import, and it can be uh, require, dynamic import, or just import from. And you would go import, you know, whatever from, and it would be app one slash drop down uh, or whatever you want. Um, and when we do that import on the host side, seeing as there's no module that exists because this is all done at runtime, the, the host needs to still return a module to Webpack so that it doesn't fail. So what we create is the container reference plugin. So what this ends up doing is from this team in here, when I'm going into the home page and I'm going to go and get this drop down remote, you'll see first uh, I have these dotted lines here and here, and you'll see how my arrows are pointing to specific dotted lines. The, re the reason that we have this kind of setup here is to showcase um, how we're able to give you synchronous imports in an async application. So if I want hooks, it's a really challenging thing for me to grab hooks in a dynamic import because they need to already be there. And I can't do that inside of a component because the component's already running. So I could use a normal synchronous import from. And what would end up happening here is you'll see uh, the container reference will create some kind of a drop down remote, or we call them a remote module inside of the host. And that remote module has a special API connection interface. So it knows how to connect to the API and get specific things off of it. One of the cool things here, though, is these dotted lines represent async imports. So when you have a dynamic import, and what's really cool here is if the dropdown is used synchronously, it will be hoisted up to the nearest parent dynamic import that it can find, which is how we're able to give you this as a synchronous import if you want it. We find the, the closest async import and we attach these additional requirements onto it. What you'll see uh, like down here with React as a shared module, it also gets hoisted up to the top. Um, and I always put an async import in between my entry point and the real entry point of the app. Um, but if we go down here to say button remote, which is only needed by the login mo modal, you'll see we code split and dynamic import the login modal. So I can just hoist any synchronous imports up to this dynamic import. So it will load these things only when it's loading the login modal. Now, of course, this is assuming you're using require and import from. If you use a dynamic import, you then the import, you know, it won't need to go to the parent import because it is a parent, it is a dynamic import. So it just puts it on itself and the app knows how to wait for it. But these are the kind of two tactics that we have from container reference aspect. This is what your host again is, is looking for. And of course, everything else will connect out to the container itself. And the container is what we're what will point to. Um, are, you know, Team B's remote, essentially, or the remote container. And all these know how to do is talk to this exposed API with Git, Initialize, and a couple other things. So if we break it down a little bit more, we'll have Container Reference Plugin. It creates the remote modules. It's used by a host, and it provides modules. So we'll see out here. It creates little async remote modules that know how to connect to the actual containers interface and pull in, you know, modules at runtime. And it also might share some things. So it might have uh, React or Lodash or a couple other things. So it will also pass out the provided modules, things that it has to offer. Uh, then, you know, when anything enters the system, we also go through a version check and it'll start to make more sense as uh, this graphic builds out. But we essentially have the consumed modules, which are things that it would be taking in. 
um, they go through semantic versioning and then they'll get passed into this container reference piece. And this is also all happening at runtime. So prior to what I was showing you before, this is kind of what it looks like in the whole picture when an app is running. So we saw what a container reference looks like. Let's see what a container looks like. So a container is what another team would expose to you. You would take their, their container entry and this is essentially what we end up having. You'd have container.js, which is uh, pretty much a very uh, craftily modified Webpack runtime. And, it lo and all that's in this Webpack runtime is essentially something like this code. It's a little bit more complex than that, but it's tiny. So we're not actually uh, downloading anything when I put this on the page, maybe five kilobytes. It's only once I actually go and try to use the button where I would then have a, the remote module inside of the host, the remote module gets executed and it knows to call get name and pretty much locate the dynamic import or the, the case that fits whatever you're trying to ask it for. And then it would return that as a promise and that's how you would get it. Uh, but the breakdown that we would see here is this is its own chunk, button is its own chunk, the drop down has two modules in it, but it's essentially its own chunk. And then React is shared, so it's split out into its own chunk as well. The reason we split it out like that is because we don't want to ship React down if we're running an omnidirectional mode, because um, we don't know if that React is actually the right copy. So when the app starts itself it, in omnidirectional mode, it will start not having React with it. And it will figure out who has the best version of React and then load a React. So diving a little deeper into our container plugin, what it does is it has exposed modules that it will pretty much create. And it will also have the provided modules that it will create as well. Same way that we'd have on, um, on, our, on our reference. And we also would have the consume modules coming in here and we would have version checks to make sure that the container and the host are compatible with each other and everything is bust backwards and forwards through there. Um, all right, so if we hop over and now this is essentially the full picture and you can see how everything comes together. We've got our container over here. We have the container reference. So we've got uh, the host on, on, on this side. We have our remote over here and we have this thing called the share scope. The share scope is uh, really, really great, because this is the magic of how we're actually able to share modules in between separate Webpack runtimes or how we're able to load them in. Um, these provided modules that go out, they first get passed into ShareScope with their versions attached, and then they get consumed back out with another version check uh, happening on either side. So we can determine who has the best copy of React, now vend that copy back to everybody. Uh, regardless if it's my copy of React or a different host's or remote's copy of React. And uh, the nice thing about ShareScope as well is you can actually have multiple ShareScopes. So if you had an app that had several different frameworks and say you had something like, uh, or a legacy app even, you could create a ShareScope called Legacy and Modern and you could have certain modules only use certain ShareScopes. So they're not exposed to the entire apps which lets you do things like have different versions of React or um, different versions of a shared dependency be loaded in and, and not seen by the other apps. So creating a container, we're gonna, this is pretty much looking at the module federation plugin itself and what each key on the module federation plugin actually does when it's running. So new module federation plugin, this just goes in your Webpack config like normal, and this would be to create a container or a remote. I give it a name and I expose some things. This is the public name and then that's the internal request. So wherever it is in the file system versus how I'd want to import it as in, in the host. I wanna import tracking slash system, but inside of this actual place where it comes from, it's just you know right there at the top level, but I can still categorize it or, or shape it a specific way. Um, then if I wanna do say sharing modules, that would be that would mean we essentially use shared, and we would add this as either an array of strings or a mixed array. And in here, we can also do things like specify React as a singleton or specify I want a required version of something explicit. Um, and 
you know, we can get into more advanced options. Like I want to strictly use this version. I can specify the version that it has to have versus uh, this was just kind of like a sim, like how a NPM would kind of work. And I can also manually say specify an import, my share scope, and I could give it another name on the share key other than the one that it has. Of course, consuming from other containers, same plugin, you would go through remotes. I want to call it, say, analytics. And this is where I'm going to find it. And really, this is kind of the global name that I would put it in as. But after this at symbol, it could be an HTTP URL. So you could go and retrieve these things over the wire from other containers that are available. And it will come together. Uh, we can also do you know, more advanced types of remotes here as well, and how we get them, how they're exposed, and where. Um, and then pretty much to use module federation plugin, it would be a combination of any of these three in whatever order it makes sense for you. So looking at a real world copy of this, we've got a uh, module federation plugin. I can see I've got app A, app B, the library types that I want to specify, which you don't really need anymore. Um, then the file name, I'm going to call them both remote entry.js. And you can see me pretty much just walk through, share out some dependencies how I want them done, what I want to be singleton, what required versions I want on there. And De depths is essentially just coming from a require package JSON. So I just pull that in to get the, the exact thing that I want. Um, it's an easy enough way to, to specify them within the advanced API. And that's pretty much all I really need to, to use this. Um, of course, it'll spit out a remote entry JS. And if you're doing something like, you know, app B, then you would want to take, you know, in my case, let's say localhost 3002, slash remote entry.js. And I would want to have that in the like HTML plugin or the HTML template here so that I can reference it as app B when this app kicks off. If I don't want to have to like statically code them out in the HTML, I can just go app B at localhost 3002 slash remote entry.js. And a webpack will automatically attach the remote container for me. Um, I have a bunch of examples online. So if anybody's wondering, um, there's some links at the end. Uh, and here's what it would look like to actually consume this. So application B, I'm going to get button, and I'm going to use uh, suspense to get this button. And that's how I would get it. Now, to show off another cool thing is, let's say I want to get the drop down from app B, and I don't want to actually use React Lazy or suspense. Well, I can also use import from drop down app B slash drop down, and I can just use it as a normal synchronous uh, module as well. Uh, so at scale, here's the example that you could end up seeing. And you can see, you know, we've got a design system components, nav components, translations, advertising, analytics, internal apps, admin apps, advertiser, main, welcome apps, and then, you know, some piece in the middle that several of them consume, which may consume lower down parts. But all of these could be deployed or managed independently, depending on the size of your team and who owns what. So supporting multiple React versions, um, it's tricky, but uh, it is possible to do this um, through an adapter pattern. And this is really helpful at scale when you're working at a large enterprise where you really can't shift off of some of those legacy applications, or you can't do it all at the same time, but you don't want to compromise your ability to move forward on the apps that you can. So I've got a short video here. I'm going to jump through a little bit of it so we get to the interesting parts. And here, pretty much, uh, it shows there I've got React 16.6.3, which is pre-React hooks. And I'm going to jump into another app. And you'll see that I've got React 16.13. So now I will go in here. And this is my modern React component. Uh, it has some use effect in here, which would pretty much throw an error in another application. And what I end up doing with it is I've got, I'm sharing out React DOM and I also share out React and I give it a new share key or a share scope on here to load it into a different scope so it doesn't conflict with my current uh, legacy version of React. And then I can go into app one, which doesn't support React hooks. And I should just be able to load it in as something like this. So that would be a normal one. And then over here, I created something called an adapter. And what my adapter would allow me to do is it would require the newer version of React and mount it inside here. So now I have a non-compatible version of React hooks where I'm typing in an input. And I have a remote that's using a modern version of React. And you can see as I type into React legacy or whatever, 
Um, you can see a modern copy of React is accepting and rendering these things without any issues actually happening. So um, applied architecture, where could or what could we end up federating? So a couple things that I've done with it already is UI code, configurations, business logic, server middleware, translations, side effects, reducers, even React context. Uh, authentication modules, and I've been pushing heavily into analytics, A-B tests, and tag management, where uh, these things are now driven by Webpack and federated systems rather than something less efficient um, that doesn't actually gel well with the engineering side of an app. So I've got another little example here, which is a shared app shell. Um, I'm going to skip through this as well quite quickly, uh, but essentially I've got five different apps loaded in here. And each app has um, pretty much just the shell wrapping around them. And if we jump forward a little bit, I've got some roots over here, which is going to define dashboard order or profile. You'll also notice in my sidebar of my file, I've got profile, dashboard, sales, a whole bunch of other things. So these are all rooting to specific remotes that I've defined higher up in the application. So what I'll end up doing here is if I go and look at um, the shell or my, my app shell system, it's called a shell. That's how it exports itself out. It exposes shell and a special service. And it also shares you know, React and React on like usual. If we look at another one like the profile micro front end, you'll see that it has a remote, which is the shell and it exposes the profile page. And that's pretty much all it's doing. And you'll see inside of uh, the profile page, I actually have the app shell as the app using React Lazy. So what ends up happening is whenever I land on anything that's not localhost 3001, I'm essentially federating the app shell into my current app. That app shell then federates my current app into it. So it's kind of circular, but Webpack handles this in the graph resolution at runtime. So it doesn't actually have a performance overhead, but we can create these circular structures that allow things to import things when they're being imported from you know, other remote locations. And so I'm just going to jump forward. The app looks you know, more or less normal. And let's get into the actual app itself. So you'll see I've got a whole bunch of tabs open here. Each tab is the same application, but each tab is a separate Webpack build. So I can go to the profile page. You'll notice that the profile page shows up. And I could inspect this. We could take a quick peek at our network and see how it's actually handling it. And I can jump through here to the order service, which only cost me 9.2 kilobytes to download. And I could jump into the dashboard, which only cost me an additional, I think in total, I've done 10 megabytes or uh, 10 kilobytes of data transfer. And again, this is also running in dev mode. So even that is quite over, you know, over the top. But, uh, you know, now I can hop over to say localhost 3004 and I can do the same thing. So even though each one of these apps is only one thing, like maybe the dashboard or the profile page or whatever, I can route and browse and use this app. And you will not know that these are separate apps running on separate ports uh, that have nothing to really do with each other. And that's all thanks to module federation. Um, so that's done through using the federated shell. So all the routes are handled up there. So the shell is actually handling you know, nested module federation and it's pulling in all of these components. Now that might not work for everybody if they don't want to have to continuously redeploy their shell to change their roots. So this is another simple, simple example if you wanted to say have your own decentralized root structures. And in there you could pretty much have you know, uh, your local roots and then you could get your remote roots from app two slash roots or whatever. Um, and you would pretty much just spread operate them into one thing and pass it back to something like React Router and everything would just work then after that. Uh, so getting into a couple other areas, we've got federated A-B tests and uh, I use Adobe Target. So I've been working a lot with, with uh, the Target implementation. So this is kind of the modeled architecture that I have running in production at the moment. And essentially, we have, say, the main site. And I've got, uh, on the other side over here, I've got an A-B test repo. And all that we really do inside of that is code up various different variants of components or completely new experiences. Or it might even just be content changes or maybe a change to the API hook that we use to go and get content. Uh, so it's the same component, technically, but it's wrapped in something that modifies the props that get sent into it. So 
pretty much when my app starts, I can do this on the server side. I can run out and I can get the segment IDs of whoever's visiting a page. And then I can have the API return the federated experience ID. And then from there, Webpack, the federated experience ID is pretty much the uh, custom piece that we've written that allows us to, with a special React component, it allows us to control Webpack um, at runtime. So we're allowed to bus uh, different experiences in, and then based on whichever one that comes back here, it will go into the remote federated module, wherever the deployed location is, and it will pull in whichever experience that I want at runtime. Um, and again, this can be... Oh, okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So to wrap this all up, non-Webpack compatibility. We have some support for this. We also have some support for Webpack 4 through API shims. We recently released Rollup Federation, which gives partial support there. And we do actually have a vanilla API for low level and uh, for a low level interface into the system. Um, and that's something that I use quite a lot on all the advanced stuff, but it is available. It's not fully Webpack exclusive. You can get other apps to consume remotes, even if they're not Webpack based apps. You'll just have to do a little bit of typing. Um, so one of the last things I'll touch on is, you know, as this new architecture evolves, we're kind of also anticipating the need for some toolings around this. So one of the cool pieces we're working on is to actually be able to see and orchestrate and control your app from a dashboard. Since everything is managed at runtime, why can't I change, why do I need to deploy anything to change anything as long as it was previously deployed once? So this dashboard lets us see who uses what and where and how. It lets us see what versions of everything is used across it, uh, choose environments and whatnot shows us which is vended and also the version history of what got shared when, where, and how, um, all of our dependencies. And in a later stage, we also have something called write mode, which actually lets me change the versions of my remotes. So we can have versioned remotes as well, or just change the versions of any of our modules. And we don't have to deploy anything. So it makes rollbacks, code freezes, partial code freezes, applied at the actual Webpack graph level instead of doing it at the dependency or repo level. Um, so last thing would be our next steps where we're going. Dashboard versioning, control, uh, code freezing, pot reloading our servers, unit tests through federation, tag manager plugins, and you know, more scope isolation would be pretty cool. Um, and yeah, since I'm over time, I'll just wrap it up. Thank you. You can scan the QR code or uh, go to github.com slash module federation. You'll find every example that I've got. Um, as well as modulefederation.github.io, which should point you to any documentation that I've made available um, in the repos and, and what, uh, whatever. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, you can feel free to uh, follow me on Twitter and ask away. And thank you for having me. Um, so that was an amazing talk. Thank you very much. Um, I will say I'm ever so slightly disappointed. Um, when I saw that this was about a module federation, I got all excited that this was going to be something Star Trek-like and <laughs> you're going to create a group of Webpack people to take over the universe, but apparently not. Well, you never know. You never know. <laughs> Webpack kind of is taking over the universe a little bit, isn't it? A little bit, a little bit. It's a Good start. We're at, we're at a good start. <laughs> Speaking of good starts, we've already had one question come in. If anybody watching along has got a question to be put to Zach, please do drop them into the Q&A and uh, vote up any that you like. So the first one is I saw IPFS on one of your last slides, but you were running out of time. Can you elaborate on how you see this in 30 seconds or less? Yes, sure. So how I see it working with IPFS is uh, this actually comes from a very old system that I wrote back in the day before even I think I think it was Webpack 2 era, but um, the the idea I had was to kind of create a CDN using IPFS and end up creating uh, on top of IPFS like another database consistency system. So using like this distributed platform, I could just push this stuff out to the to our end users and have them do the work of verifying the, that the data is consistent and serving it from their browsers instead of serving it from my servers. 
Um, anyway, as time evolved, I wrote module federation and I was like, wow, this could really, because a lot of questions come up around redundancy and failover and what happens if the remote's offline? Well, we can put an array of remotes in, so if they fail, they can have a fallover to the next kind of, you know, origin on the CDN and it just naturally fits really well with IPFS. So how it work with IPFS is probably uh, have a plugin that just, just uploads it to the IPFS servers. And then um, how that would actually hook in inside a Webpack is there's actually already a lot of IPFS plugins out there. So I'd probably just pull one down and alter it slightly. But honestly, I wouldn't even need to do that because we would just point to say, hey, the remote is at this IPFS address. And that address is immutable and won't change and is you know bound to your hash. So um, all I would do is instead of it being localhost or HTTP, whatever, I would just say, hey, well, the remote is at IPFS over here. And essentially, I would be pulling it all in through a dis you know, distributed network. There wouldn't be any chance of the file going missing because the file is, you know, immutable in the graph and the in the uh, whatever it is the the file that makes sure all crypto is fine. I forgot the actual name for it. <laughs> the big scary file that should be backed up ten times over. <laughs> yeah, pretty. I, the I don't know what it's called. But yeah, so that's kind of how I see it working is, you know, more or less how you would use IPFS data to just upload something is just, well, what if it's another upload target of your deploy and it's kind of your fallback? Or you could make it your primary and just have like a hostless system where you can distribute the stuff across a decentralized network that is extremely hard to take down and then is super resilient and also gets super quick depending on the demand for traffic. Hmm. Sounds like the perfect solution for it. That was a brilliant answer. Brilliant answer. Um, so somebody's asked already if they can have your PowerPoint. Um, is that something that you're going to be tweeting out or should they rewatch the talk at a later date? Um, I would say I can tweet out a copy of the PowerPoint. I'll just need to remove one or two things. And also note that like the PowerPoint's like 50 or 60 slides and I took out, I've hidden a lot of them. So if you want the PowerPoint, just open it up and you'll see all the other content that I skip over depending on time. Uh, but a better place to get content would be finding me on Twitter and just get, uh, and or, or go to a Google module federation and go to the github.com slash module dash federation. In there, I've got every article that I've written or, or links to like all of the YouTube casts that have been done, interviews, people I've worked with, talks from other Webpack founders, um, my own screencasts, and pretty much a central hub on advanced usage, current usage. And of course, the repo contains, I think, 30 or 40 different examples of module federation, including things like Next.js or Svelte or Angular and SSR and so on. Wow, you've gone over, over and above with that little collection of documents and videos. Much better than just but the, the key to success is documentation, <laughs> especially on the new technology that you're bringing out. Definitely, definitely. Um, speaking of new technology, this next one is about Code Sandbox, which is still fairly new, I would say. And um, do you think tools like Code Sandbox will adapt this to reduce infrastructure costs instead of pulling all of the dependencies into a container? And thank you for that one, Thomas. Um, that's a good point. I would say. Probably once, but the, then there would have to be that mandate of, okay, everybody uses Webpack Pi. And, but if we get to that stage or once that stage is commonplace, and I think the, you know, we're still in beta, but I know that we will probably see a RC show up sometime in the near future. So um, once we're, you know, more in the RC space, then what's going to end up happening likely is we'll see some of these things. Like I know Storybooks already looked at uh, using module federation so that, deploying your storybook is moving to production. And that's how the system would work. And you could have catalogs of storybooks to aggregate through each team. Um, stuff like Code Sandbox, I could definitely see it being used. Or what it would probably start off with is I would see people using Module Federation on Code Sandbox. Instead of actually putting it all back together, they might just proxy in a piece of an app that they've got somewhere else and demo it there instead of copying the code over or having to you know, ship it to NPM just for the sake of the example. Yeah. Um, so that's likely where I'd see it going. Code Sandbox, I would say what I'd probably do and what I've done with a lot of uh, companies or groups or open source, you know, authors is I'll try to get hold of them and say, hey, have you heard of this? Give it a shot. If you need some help, let me know. Uh, I think it could work out well. So since you brought up the idea of Code Sandbox, I'll probably try to find out who 
how to get in touch with the uh, with the people who run it and see if they think that this is something that could help them. Then if it is, I'm more than happy to give some time to actually make that a reality. Um, I, I can't remember their names, but I know they're very active on Twitter and very open to collaboration, um, as far as I can tell from seeing them online. I, I know, I think it's called Blitz or Bits um, with a Z. They, they do like component libraries, but like in the cloud, so you can manage your components through like a UI. I know they wrote an article on using module or using module federation with their system, and it was pretty cool because it was just a library of components. You could kind of choose what you want, and they were always evergreen and they were decentralized. So, yeah, I could definitely see some you know other more commercially products starting to leverage this. Okay, um, is a code sam sandbox demo something that you've got in that little web page of resources? No, I do not. Mostly because my bandwidth is so constrained that, like all of my little examples that I show, are just like uh, you know, from ten to twelve at night, I'll be have an idea and crash it out, and then ta da, there we go. So, uh, no, I don't. But if anybody wants to try one, I will happily get hold of you on Twitter, and we can figure it out. It's purely been there hasn't been an ask, and I haven't had the. Uh, the time <laughs> okay thomas it sounds like there's a way there for you to get involved with uh, webpack module federation in some way um speaking of getting involved is this something that people can openly contribute to at the moment or are we a little bit away from that you can openly contribute to it but i would say that the feature is pretty much done and coded yeah um there's like one or two outstanding pieces it's been about i think six months of rebuilding webpack 5 to get it there um and yeah, I, I would say if you know Webpack's internal API as well, especially fives, then there's definitely always room for, for contribution. But um, I've been you know, coding the Webpack core since Webpack 1, and even doing some of this stuff with Module Federation was outside my, uh, my sanity limits. I know I had to have Tobias code parts of, of this because it's pretty hairy in there. But it's definitely good to read. And if you want to try and contribute, then totally do. Either way, it's a great learning experience and a great way to kind of understand more about how Webpack works under the hood. OK, so probably not somebody's fast contribution, but you are open to it in, in principle. Oh, oh yeah, totally. Um, I would say if you're looking for first contributions, what I do with like some engineers at my company and so on, uh, they want to get involved with it. I say, hey, um, make some tutorials about it. You know, it's your first time going through it. We'll jump on a call. We'll do like a quick, you know, one of my most basic demos. Get button to load from here and button to load over there, and have each app interchange their buttons. And then, uh, you know, I'll kind of say, okay, cool. Now that you've got that under your belt, um, you know, what do you want to build? And then I'll throw out some ideas on how or what or why. Um, but that's generally what I would say. Or try something new that's not in my examples repo and then pull requests back the examples repo. And that's also a really great way to get involved and to show off other examples or even refine my existing ones. Because, I mean, it's, you know, time, there's always better solutions to whatever I, you know, conjure up in there. So if you see something better or you see something you want to fix, it's also a good way to get involved, you know, with, an official module federation repo or system. Awesome. Um, so Thomas, definitely get involved. Uh, so we've got one last question before we uh, wrap this one up. If I managed Ape and pulled in the latest version of a button component, how do I ensure that I don't break someone else's app who also depends upon that button? All right. Is there a way so, to test this as well? Mm, yeah. OK, well. Uh, you sure you don't want to be a contributor? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, on, on a serious note, yeah, so testing um, is a little tricky. Uh, I have not actually tried this in theory, or I haven't tried it in practice, but I know in theory it'll work. Uh, what it would involve is you could do unit tests, federated unit tests, make just be built out by Webpack, and pretty much put the dynamic import mechanism somewhere in there. Everything else can be synchronous and just will be fine with it. Uh, and then you, it would essentially just would be pulling in the test files on demand. Um, for doing something like this, I would say it'd probably be easier to just have it locally installed so you're because it's all going to run on Node. And I don't really have module streaming to a point where I'm going to publicly talk about it. So you would need the file to have disk access to perform your testing um, if you want to do like standard unit tests. So some of the ideas that I have around how you can stop this is one, we have you can just create versioned remotes. So your remote could have a version attached to it. 
and you could then just manage which version of the remote gets loaded. Um, so if you change any change that comes along, you could either go evergreen or managed, depending on what you want. And then it's you wouldn't break anything else, and if you do, it's only because somebody bumped up to a new version, kind of like how NPM would be. But this could all happen at runtime, which means you could also control this at runtime on the other end, where I could have something like dashboard just change the version of where my remote should come from, and I could just pull in different deploys, you know, at will without needing to redeploy or do anything with like our infrastructure, um, other than you know change who should have what right now. So yeah, there, there's plenty of ways to do it. Um, I probably should make a video about it, but I would say another area would be uh, I, I'm using something called like a API, uh, like module API contracts. So when you expose something, I don't just expose like the vanilla thing. And I'll usually use this on like context or something when I want to share them. But uh, the idea is I want to provide a standardized way to just like a RESTful API, there's a data contract. This thing's going to take this and it's going to work. And if you don't give it this, it's not going to work. So when I want to build unit tests, what you could do as a provider of these things, you could have a you know, very simple little kind of wrapper that pretty much checks, yes, this is going to work or no, it's not. And then the data contract is you need to provide things like this, this, and this. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to render. And you could unit test to make sure that you don't break the contract that you've created. Um, it is like one extra step in there, but if we're looking for that level of like security at enterprise and you know really want to make sure everything is going to work, then I would say it's a it's a decent option to consider. Um, but you know there's there's ways around it. I personally I don't have too many issues with this just because like we we manage it relatively well and we're also smart about what we use. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. <laughs> so consider where Federation fits. I want to share React really bad. I have, you know, 35 teams and several uh, micro front ends. So I don't really care about button, but I really care about the whole page. So I share at the root level and then I share at my dependency level for things like the pattern library and stuff like that. Um, and then if there's one or two custom components, like let's say I have like a checkout add to cart modal, then I'd like that to live in the checkout team who maintains it, not in some other micro front end just because they need to pop up and show it and then have the team have to jump between two repos, one they own and one they're only there because they own a component. Um, so that's really where I try to go with it. Also, I would say a big thing is start small, start safe, see how it works, and then you build up things around it. Um, but in my experience, I really don't think that if you're going full swing into federated apps, I really don't think that we're going to have too many issues with versioning or testing or anything like that, because everything that I've seen so far, it already shows ve very promising that there's not too many problems, like not too many things we're going to be hinged by. Perfect. So it shouldn't be a problem, but in theory, <laughs> it's a summary. In theory, it sh yeah. Like if for unit tests shouldn't be a problem in theory, module contracts, you know, that'd be something manual. You would come up with like a pattern, just like a, yeah. if you treat it like a restful API, then okay. I, the module takes props and I have, you know, strict validation on those and, or whatever, and send it to Sentry if somebody errors it or automatically roll back to the previous remote because, you know, keep that remote deployed somewhere. And those patterns take very little time to implement once you get a feel for module federation, which is why I say start simple. Um, because all of these, I was just like, oh, cool. Well, if I, you know, put the remote entry.js on the CDN, but put it in a folder with all the other chunks on the flat level, then all I need to do is change the URL of my remote entry and it'll just pull in whatever chunks it wants at the flat level on the CDN which is a really nice way to just flip between remotes or version the remotes. You keep the deploy all on one level. If they, if the modules didn't change, the hashes will be the same. So you get higher caching capability. And the only thing you're separating into like a human known, like URL format would be the remote entry file or the, the path to it. Um, you know, whatever.com slash V 1.1 slash remote entry JS and remote entry JS just goes to whatever.com slash assets and gets all of its chunks off the top level. So, you know, there's there's lots of ways to safeguard it and also just to start experimenting. And once you try one or two of these things, you're going to see, oh, okay, well, to do this is going to be pretty easy. I would say the one area that is going to be a little tricky is server-side pulling those remotes in um, if you want to do, like, server-side unit tests. But we will soon be releasing a streamed module, not through Webpack, but through the Module Federation group. And streaming will essentially make Node work like it does in a browser. 
it will go over the internet or over the network to download its chunks just like a code split browser app would, except the chunks I'm downloading come from separate Webpack builds on the server as well. So that gives us a huge unlock because now we don't need to worry about, well, where is it on the disk? It's just, just like in the browser, give it a URL and it'll get the script. Well, that sounds perfect. And on that amazing feature announcement, um, we're going to have to call time on this, I'm afraid. Zach, where can people find you online if they want to follow up on anything you've said? Twitter. Uh, Twitter, GitHub, all my user handles across everything is scripted alchemy. So you can find me on twitter.com. Uh, just scripted alchemy or Zach Jackson. And that's my central point of communication right now. Um, so get me on Twitter and any questions you have, I'm pretty open. So don't be scared. Um, I can get lost in a random conversation for an hour with, with somebody who just has simple conversation. So really like, don't be scared. You got questions. Half the success of this is making sure everybody understands it and is comfortable with it. And also getting your feedback because we have the ability to change Webpack for, for now. So, the more feedback that we have, the the more change we can make on the core before we actually go into RC. Very wise words. Zach, thank you very much for an amazing talk. Thank you for this amazing conversation. I think we could carry on for hours, but unfortunately, we've got another Q&A starting <laughs> shortly. Um, Zach, thank you again, and thank you for all the time you and the team put into Webpack. I'm sure most people at this conference use it either daily or weekly. Um, you saved all of these people thousands of hours i'm guessing i hope so that's the intent so um yeah looking forward if anybody has anything wants to mention anything find me on twitter otherwise thanks for coming and listening to to my talk and thank you for having me uh, to all the hosts who who are part of this awesome catch you soon zach and see you later everyone <laughs>